Good evening, councillors, members of the gallery, and to our viewers live streaming tonight's meeting. My name is Councillor Dale Martin, and I'm the chairperson of the Urban Planning Committee. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's meeting. Our meeting is being held on the traditional country of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. I acknowledge that many, many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have made more than home, and in doing so, have contributed to the positive rich diversity of this municipality. Members of the gallery, please note that this urban planning meeting is being recorded and web streamed live to Council's website and Facebook. This recording will also be available as video on demand. Gallery attendees are advised that they will be recorded during the meeting. Councillors, just a reminder that in line with the adopted councillor con conduct principles as outlined in the councillor code of conduct, councillors should ensure that they conduct themselves in the meeting with integrity, impartiality, and exercise their responsibilities in the interest of the local community and not improperly seek to confer advantage any person. This behaviour will support principles for leadership and good governance that secures public confidence in the office of councillor. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation. Councillors in attendance tonight are Councillor Natalie Booth, the Deputy Mayor. Councillor Sue Bolton. Hi. Councillor Helen Davidson. Good evening. Councillor Jess Dorney. Hi. Councillor Alia Farnley. Good evening. Councillor Lambros Tapnos. Good evening. And Councillor Oscar Yildiz. The officers in attendance tonight are Acting Group Manager of City Development, Narelle Jennings. Acting Unit Manager of Urban Planning, Mark Hughes. Planning Coordinator, Darren Camilleri. Unit Manager of Governance, Sally Curran. And Governance Op Officer, Saskia Hunter. Councillors, I note that uh, Councillor Anna Olivia Cully Hannon is on an approved leave of absence, and I have received an apology from Councillor John Kavanagh and Councillor Mark Riley. Are there any other apologies for tonight's meeting? No, in that case, uh, I'll put those apologies to a vote. All those in favour? Those against? I declare that carried. <coughs> Moving on to the adoption of the minutes. Um, could I please have a motion for the adoption of the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of March, 2018? Uh, moved by Councillor Davidson, seconded by Councillor Farnley. Councillors, um, all those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Thank you. Councillors, I ask, are there any uh, interest, uh, conflicts of interest or, um, or interest to declare tonight? No? Okay, thank you very much. Moving on. Uh, I wish to give everyone in the audience, uh, in the gallery here tonight, um, an overview of how the Urban Planning Committee will run this evening. Firstly, the relevant plan will introduce the report and the officer's recommendations. Then I will give the opportunity for any objectors to move to the lectern to make their submission. After this time, the applicant will be given the opportunity to speak. If you are making a submission, please clearly state your name and address for the record. You are requested to present your viewpoints clearly and concisely on why you support or oppose the planning application. Please endeavour to not repeat what earlier speakers have said and keep the discussion focused on relevant issues and points not previously raised. If you are opposed to the planning application, would you please inform the committee why you are opposed and suggest an alternative approach which would satisfy your concerns. Please use this opportunity to focus on your concerns rather than the matters of detail in the officer's report. Please note that there is a limit of three minutes for each speaker, but as chairperson, I reserve the right to increase or reduce time available to any speaker. So now with that out of the way, uh, I'd like to move on to the first officer report for tonight, um, and that is 16 to 24 Box Forest Road, Glenroy. Thank you, councillors, and good evening, members of the gallery. The first item for this evening is an application at 16 to 24 Box Forest Road. It's actually an amendment to an existing planning permit. The planning permit dates back to 1997 and it allowed for the development and use of the land for the purpose of movable dwellings, associated community and recreational facilities, a caretaker's dwelling, and removal of native vegetation. The proposal uh, introduces an additional six dwellings to the site, two at the front, four at the back, um, and each dwelling will comprise two bedrooms. Bring the total number of dwellings on the site to 187. The subject site is located about 100 metres west of Sydney Road, on the northern side of Box Forest Road. Uh, it extends uh, deep into the site. As I mentioned, uh, the purple at the top, in the top corner of the, the picture, in the northeast uh, corner of the site, uh, is the location of four dwellings. Uh, just to the south of that is uh, the connection over Campbell, Campbellfield Creek. Uh, and in the southern end of the site is uh, an area which is currently uh, 
landscape and that uh, will encompass two dwellings. Taking you there to the proposal, proposed locations and floor plans, elevations of the dwellings. There were nine objections uh, to the application. A uh, consultation meeting was held uh, with the residents and councillors on the 16th of February. Unfortunately, uh, there was no resolution reached. Uh, the key issues that came out of that, uh, out of the objections and through the consultation, was a loss of the green space, particularly uh, at the front of the site, traffic and car parking, and the, the feeling that there was no, no demand for additional housing. The recommendation uh, this evening before councillors is that um, notice a decision to grant an amendment to the planning permit be issued uh, with con additional conditions to the 1997 planning permit, uh, which introduces changes, essentially bringing the uh, uh, consistent with the current planning scheme provisions, particularly in relation to sustainable development, some minor am amendments to achieve compliance with the Rose Code. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'll call on the gallery um, if there are any objectors who wish to uh, come to the lectern to speak on this item. Please come forward. Um, my, I'm Judith Williams. I reside at Federation Village, Glen Ryan. Um, we have put in our petition and all our objections to the um, building of these, well, actually the two houses in the front of the entrance of the um, village. Um, we just feel that it's not very fair that they should be built there because there is a lot of reasons and we do like to see our green... Um, if anything, there is a lot of things in the village that need to be fixed before erecting six new houses. Um, everything that we've done has been in the objections, the, um, sent to the planning, sent to the, uh, the councillors, and that's our objection. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other objectives? No. Yeah. Do I have to put my name? Uh, yes, please, yeah, if, if okay. you like. Anne Bonnet from Federation Village. That's fine. This is probably an emotional reasons, but I hope you all understand. Um, there is three, uh, 13 empty villas for sale, <clears throat> and there's six more going on the agenda. So to me, that is a glut of properties. Also, the elderly with health issues are not really at this stage going to buy into independent living with no one on site after 4 p.m. to help in an emergency. So other villages with, with more, uh, or even if they are similar in the price range, will be the ones people will look at for the long term. For, for residents at Federation Village wanting to move on, they have a dilemma, putting their property up for sale, adding to the glut of places already for sale. And as villas decline in value, they stand to lose money. The green area we are trying to preserve is a reminder of how things can change and not for the best. In the, in the unusable area for the residents will be living in this and they already live in an atmosphere of uncertainty. In my opinion, all's well do not have the ageing population in mind with six more villas to house the elderly. Perhaps I am a cynic, which is what my daughter now adds. We may not be able to stop this building going ahead, so we need to focus our efforts on minimising the impact to the elderly residents who are unable to leave while under construction. Please build these units off-site, like your website states. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And um, would you um, care to explain what that is that you've just passed to it Councillor? It's a laminated uh, screenshot of Oswell website claiming that they do build off-site and drop it off to the village. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, are there any other objectors that wish to speak tonight? No? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, is the applicant or a representative of the applicant here that wishes to speak? Please come forward. Evening, councillors. Uh, my name is Nevin Wadeson. I'm from Track Consultants. And we have uh, Joel Douglas from Allswell here if there are questions specific to uh, their operation. Uh, as it happens, I was the town planner who was involved in uh, getting the original permit for this site. So uh, I don't look as old as back in 1999, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyway, so look, uh, the history to this was we applied for the development. Council at that time uh, looked at it very carefully, mandated CPI managed costings and all that sort of thing. So there are some cost pressures on this uh, village which are different to others. And in quick summary, from those early days of that permit, it's been a great success to see the village uh, delivered as it has been. The additional six units, four at the northeast corner and two at the front, are proposed to help add extra supply to this fundamentally required aged housing stock, you might call it. Now, the importance of uh, these villas is there's constant inquiry both for new and old, but as, uh, in terms of the numbers being vacant at any one time, as you'd imagine, the place is now about 19 years old, and so therefore there's a lot of uh, uh, changeover, and so 9 or 10% is not unusual in, in a turnover situation. Um, in the area, there's quite a number of uh, people who live in the category of the age group who could be attracted, so about 2,300. Uh, 23,000 people between that 50 to 74 age. So the current housing stock represented by Federation Village and also Summerhill Residential Park is relatively low by comparison to what that group might need. Um, Federation Village is consistently requiring uh, or receiving inquiries for new homes and some in fact being new, not remade homes. Um, there are a number of benefits to living and in terms of the uh, construction, these were constructed on site originally and uh, originally through the whole build and the new ones are proposed on site. I think the, I'm told by Joel that uh, the New South Wales situation is where that particular reference to off site building occurs and you can ask him that question if you need to. Um, so look, conscious of uh, time, uh, we are formalising four car parks at the front which are informally there but we're formalising them. Um, we're adding extra trees, 32 trees, for the removal of two. So there is some extra greening going on. And uh, basically the uh, endorsed uh, plans that we originally had back in 99 had the space at the front for two dwellings. They were going to be two display dwellings, but at that time the developer chose not to use them. So the, the key concern side, if you like, has an endorsed plan showing two dwellings in that location, although they weren't built. So, in conclusion, we believe that the six units will be a positive addition to an affordable uh, housing type that's desperately needed. And also the design of the dwellings is to match in with the current uh, supply as well as stock and landscape. Happy to take any questions or those of Joel too, if you wish. Thank you very much. Um, Councillors, do we have any questions for the uh, applicant? <coughs> Councillor Davidson. Hi. Sorry, I didn't catch when you said that um, the existing plans had two dwellings at the front. And yes. was those plans, were they from back in 1999? Yes. Yes, yeah, okay. The, I've got the copy there that the endorsed plan had two dwellings in the exact location where the front dwellings were. Yep. And it was marked as display dwellings. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Abood. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify, <laughs> sorry, love you hearing yo-yo there. Um, just wanted to clarify uh, that you that you just stated that the dwellings won't be built off site; they will be built on the site. Well, I think that's that's the situation. Yes, they'll be uh, yeah. constructed on site, but the whole village was constructed on site. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So in New South Wales, there's a requirement for our communities in New South Wales to build off site transport. And Sorry, if you, if you could just come to the lectern, yeah. it'd be great. Joel. Uh, Joel Douglas, thank you, Councillor, for your question. So in New South Wales, at all of our communities, there's an obligation for us to uh, build homes off-site, transport them to site, and then crane them onto piers or foundations. And do you have any understanding of why that is the case? Like what, what the goal is with that scenario? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, ultimately it's about disturbing existing residents if there's existing residents within the communities, if there are existing residents. If you're staging a new development, there might be you know, new residents already in the village themselves, so it's about uh, to minimise disruption. 
Of but it, but that's not the case with the development that's being proposed. That's right. So the residents that um, do you have anything in place to try and minimise the disruption to the current residents, considering that um, you won't be adhering to those New South Wales rules? Uh, well, we would like to build on site, of course, uh, in this instance. Um, however, to minimise disruption, we would propose to minimise the hours of trade that you know workmen can be on site, mm -hmm. and whether that be from nine to four, Monday to Friday. Um, 8 o'clock till midday on, on a Saturday and obviously no working after midday on a Saturday and no working on a Sunday. So they're the sorts of things that we'd like to implement if it's if it's approved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank, you. thank you. I believe um, you might have to stand at Councillor Bolton, you have a question as well? Yeah, um, just following on from those questions, um, why, given that there is opposition from uh, residents in, in the village who are already living there, why you won't do what um, you, and you're doing in New South Wales of building off site and moving them, you know, to minimise the disruption to residents while you're not doing a similar thing. Even if you're not legislatively required to sure, do that, sure, sure. you could still, it's within your power to do that. Uh, yeah, in Victoria, it's a little bit different. Uh, builders and manufacturers of relocatable dwellings aren't necessarily set up to manufacture in house, so they don't have. Uh, industrial yards or warehouses where they're typically built as they do in New South Wales. Uh, if it is a condition of the consent, um, obviously we would look into it, of course, uh, but our preference obviously is to, you know, for logistical sake, is to build on site. But we're, you know, we would be flexible if that's a, an issue, of course. But it's uh, much more difficult in Victoria than it is in other states. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, councillors, are there any further questions? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, councillors, given there are no further questions, um, could I please have a motion for this uh, this item? Councillor Davidson? Yes, I've got an alternate motion. Um, and the alternate motion, I won't read the entire... If you um, just, yeah, outline it and then we'll get a seconder. Yeah. So the alternate motion uh, is that the two, two new dwellings that are proposed in Precinct A be deleted... And if I have a seconder, I'll speak to it. I second it there by Councillor Raput. Okay. okay, sorry, I do have another question to ask um, for the officer, just about the hours of operation for the construction. I know this is a bit out <coughs> of line with how procedure runs. Okay, um, we might just, um, if, if you would like to just ask the question um, briefly to the officer, otherwise we can, um, adjourn for a brief moment if you would prefer. Um, yeah, so just to include in the alternate recommendation that I'm proposing um, to have the condition that between 9 and 4, Monday, on, Monday to Friday and uh, not after 12 on Saturday and not on Sunday. If we could add that into um, this alternate motion, that would be good. Um, so, I'm on okay at point J on the alternate motion, and then um, so, to add so councillors, I, um, I might ask that we just adjourn for just a brief moment, so we can um, some get some further wording uh, for this motion. Apologies to those in the gallery and to those web streaming. Um, we'll just adjourn for a brief moment, um, so we can uh, add in.
Um, okay, uh, councillors, members of the gallery, um, thank you for bearing with us a brief moment. We just had to um, amend uh, uh, Councillor Davidson's alternative motion. We just wanted to make sure that we have the correct wording uh, for that alternative motion. Uh, so, Councillor Davidson, if you'd like to outline uh, your, your amendments, um, I believe it's already been... Um, I'll get Councillor um, Abood, if, if you'd like to second uh, the additional amendments, if that's yeah, yep. acceptable. So, yep. just so for please. clarification, um, the first one um, is uh, 2J, and that reads, the two new dwellings proposed in Precinct A be deleted um, and to retain the existing green space. And then if we go down to number 46, and that's therefore renumbering number, 40, uh, number 47 as well. So it's a new condition, um, which reads, I'll just wait for it to come up on the screen. Yeah. So construction of dwellings approved by the amendment to this permit must only occur between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday to Friday and 9 a.m. Uh, to 12 noon on Saturday. Um, and thank you, Councillor Abood, for seconding um, this amendment. And the reasons I have for proposing this is essentially to approve four new dwellings on the site, but to retain the open space. Um, we've got a community here that is very tight knit and they're a community that has given a lot to Moreland as a whole and a piece of open space that has been open space since the plans were first introduced in 1999. That's 18 years of open space. Regardless of the fact that these plans had uh, the potential for housing to be built on them, it hasn't been used that way. And residents have enjoyed this open space for 18 years. And I don't want to underestimate the importance of open space in our community. It's not right that residents should, from this, this small community that they have inside there, need to walk an additional several hundred metres down the road to go to open space to enjoy that piece of land. It's existing there now, and I cannot put my hand on my heart and say yes to approving those two dwellings there. It's not necessary. The dwellings at the back um, I'm satisfied with, they can be approved, but this piece of land here should be retained for the residents. Um, and it's for those reasons that I won't be approving the officer recommendation. Thank you, Councillor David. Councillor Abu, would you like to say something? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, I just want to draw attention to the new point 46, um, which specifically talks to the health and well-being of the residents of the venue, um, sorry, of the establishment. Uh, I think I hadn't actually thought about the timing of the construction, but once we realised that these dwellings won't be made off site and dropped in, which is um, something that I don't understand about the Victorian rules, but we've, that's what we've got to deal with. Um, I think that the idea about when the work could be done sort of fits in line with the shopping hours of, you know, that we probably enjoyed way back when as well. Um, and I think that that calm on a Saturday afternoon and also on a Sunday is a, pr a pretty important part of being able to achieve this plan without too much disruption um, to the current residents of um, the venue. So I think this is a happy compromise, four out of the six. Um, I agree with Councillor Davidson that, you know, keeping that little green space at the front, not only, you know, as a Greens councillor, we're saving an old tree, but it also talks to the aesthetic of the venue when you get there, um, which is something that the residents who've lived there for a long time are very used to seeing when they show up. Um, adding four dwellings at the back of the, of the um, venue is not going to have so much of an impact and I believe that um, the working hours for this um, construction is going to also talk to the well-being of the residents. Thank you Councillor Abood. Um, councillors, are there any councillors that wish to speak against this motion? No? Okay, um, in that case um, I'm going to actually put this item to a vote. So councillors, um, all those in favour? All those against? Um, I declare that carried unanimously. I'll move back to the officer for next steps. Thank you, councillors. The Urban Planning Committee have determined to issue a notice of decision to grant an amendment to, to the planning permit, uh, subject to the amended conditions put forward by Councillor Davidson tonight. All, of, all resident objectors will receive a copy of the notice of decision and will have 21 days in which to lodge an appeal. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to the next report for this evening, and that is um, 8 to 14 Michael Street, Brunswick. 
uh, Planning Permit Application NPS 2016-989. We'll give the gallery a moment if they wish to uh, move around. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So this is a proposal for uh, the development of land for the construction of an eight-storey building over two levels of basement car parking containing 74 dwellings at 8 to 14 Michael Street in Brunswick. The site's in a commercial one zone and inspected by design and development overlay schedule 18. In particular, it's got a 25 metre preferred maximum height and a 20 metre preferred maximum street wall to Michael Street. There's an aerial, there's an image of the proposal um, as taken from Michael Street. Uh, the proposal's got a maximum building height of 26.25 metres or 1.25 metres above the preferred. It contains 74 dwellings with a mixture of one, two and three bedroom dwellings. There's 81 car parking spaces within the development and 83 bicycle spaces proposed. On the screen now is a 3D image of the proposal as seen from the rear of the site, uh, from the laneway. We can see on the west um, of the site is the live uh, music venue, Howler. Mm -hmm. That's a 3D image of the proposal as seen from Michael Street. And there's a close-up image of the elevation uh, to Michael Street. Quickly going through the proposed floor plans, we can see that the vehicle access is uh, to the uh, east of the site um, and the proposal is wrapped around with dwellings to the rear and the front. <coughs> As we move up, we have uh, light ports to the um, east and west, which the dwellings are prim primarily oriented to or facing to the laneway or to Michael Street. And that same design then repeats itself as we move up through the second floor and the third floor and as we move up throughout the design. Uh, on the, from the fifth floor onwards, there is just a correction to the report on page 13 and 14 of the agenda. There is reference to um, the building separation numerical requirements being met for all the dwellings. Um, this shows an eight metre building separation uh, to the uh, east uh, and nine metres would be required, so there's a slight uh, variation to that, but that doesn't change the recommendation that's been put forward to the committee. The one metre variation is considered acceptable, especially given the outlooks to the um, north. As we move up to the sixth floor, we have a rooftop garden and the top floor located there. On the screen now is an elevation um, of the west elevation, which shows that the proposal is generally in compliance with the sight line diagram, which uh, requires the upper levels to be recessed. The design development overlay requires a, um, a three metre setback, but a, a setback in uh, excess of that is provided. So that ensures that the upper levels um, are recessive with the street wall being the dominant feature. Um, this is the elevation as seen from uh, the entertainment venue, uh, which shows, it's hard to see on the screen there, but there is um, a 16 metre um, wall being proposed, or a glazed wall, which is for acoustic treatment of the site. The proposal was advertised and received 426 objections. The key objector concerns, it's probably fair to say that the first one is, is the key issue and that the, the concern was that it's inappropriate to have apartments so close to the live music venue um, and the impacts of noise and vibration that that would have. Uh, that is a key consideration in the officer's assessment of the application as outlined in the officer's report. Um, the applicant submitted a detailed acoustic um, report that has 
um, undertaken acoustic testing on site in 2017. And based on that acoustic testing, has done a floor by floor assessment of the proposal and made recommendations in relation to um, glazing and other matters to ensure that the proposal um, will comply with the requirements of that section of the planning scheme. The other key objective concerns were lack of car parking, as I mentioned, there's 81 car spaces proposed, which satisfies the requirements of the planning scheme. And the other concern was uh, excessive height um, and the 1.25 metres. Uh, in addition, in excess of the preferred height was considered acceptable in this instance. <coughs> um, based on that, uh, the officer's recommendation is that council's submission to VCAT be that a planning permit should issue based on the conditions contained in the agenda. Primarily, they relate to acoustic measures um, consistent with the acoustic report that was submitted in support of the application and other conditions about environmental audit, uh, landscape and plan, and importantly, future testing of, of acoustic measures. Um, this matter is scheduled to be heard at the Victorian, uh, at VCAT, um, and a compulsory conference is scheduled uh, for the 8th of May. Um, and what's happened is amended plans have been circulated to parties uh, just this week uh, in relation to that key issue of uh, acoustic concerns related to the live music venue. And on the screen is, on the left-hand side, is the advertised plans which form the basis of the officer's recommendation contained in the report. And on the right-hand side um, are some without prejudice plans that have been circulated, I guess, for discussion at that that uh, meeting, which seeks to address some of the concerns um, of the key objector being the live music venue. It's essentially flipping the design so that the access way is, is on the uh, side facing the music venue to reduce the amount of, uh, I guess, dwellings that are directly abutting uh, that venue. And it reduces the number of apartments um, facing the laneway to two, from three to two. And it also changes the, the first floor with a, a reorientation of the apartments to assist with the acoustic attenuation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can I ask if there are any objectors here tonight that wish to speak to this item? Please come forward. My name is Brendan Brogan from Howler. Howler is considered the premier music venue in the city of Moreland. It's also considered one of the premier music venues in Melbourne, if not Victoria. It's right next door to this. 74 people's apartments right next door to the music venue. When deciding where to put Howler, we could have put it anywhere. We put it in the city of Moreland. We put it here because of the people of the city of Moreland <coughs> because of the culture of the city of Moreland. But mostly because we'd found a site that was commercially zoned, it was close to public transport, but most of all, it was a long, long way from its neighbours. We knew how the wall worked in relation to sound. And then we sound attenuated to the letter of the wall. We located our neighbours. We designed against our noise emissions. We met our obligations. Can the same be said for this development? We built a world-class venue and we are a huge asset to the city of Moreland. We focus on live music, but we offer the full spectrum of the arts, including theatre, comedy, film and even opera. We've hosted multiple Grammy Award winners, many ARIA Award winners. We host the Triple J Awards, broadcast nationally. We broadcast on Radio National with The Moth and we've even hosted six of the major events at this year's Brunswick Music Festival. Yet. If the agent of change law is not enforced here, our future is bleak. We're a huge economic benefit to the City of Moreland also. We paid $1.1 million in wages last year. We sold 40,000 tickets, generating over a million dollars in ticketing income, most of which is paid directly to artists. The 426 objections you see a testament to the role that Howler plays in the community. If these apartments get constructed in their current form, 
particularly with the bedrooms near the rear stage and in a lot of cases abutting the rear stage, it will threaten the existence of howler altogether. Music noise will travel through the structure. It will travel into people's bedrooms. People will complain. Unfortunately, people won't complain to the developer that sold them the apartment, the developer that didn't meet the agent of change. They'll complain to council, and council will complain to us. The current proposal will see new residents and howler at loggerheads over noise emissions immediately. This is not something that can be fixed once the building is built. It needs to be done now at the design stage. The developer may argue that their acoustic report by Renzo Tonin states the building can be compliant. However, we have engaged two other companies, Marshall Day and Arup, who say this is not the case. We urge council to be cautious. Locking in support for a project on the basis of a disputed acoustic report can only lead to a poor quality of life for all future residents. Thank you. Are there any other objectors that wish to speak? I'd like to, I think there's a lawyer here, though, behind the music Thank you. Please. My name is Nick Tweedy. I'm here as a representative of Music Victoria, which is an objector to this application. Thank I you. also happen to be a barrister with 20 years' experience in planning and environment. I just tell you that to hope that you think that I know what I'm talking about. Um, Music Victoria's participation in this application is recognition of both the importance of Howler to the community of Moreland and indeed the community of Melbourne but also the importance of the agent of change principle embodied in clause 5243. And if you support this application in its current form, you will be putting at risk both the uh, future of Howler and the integrity of that principle. Now, two weeks ago, in fact, it was one week ago, I was asked to speak at an international convention held on music cities on the agent of change principle. And that was because Clause 5243 and the principles it embodies are considered to be world leading in terms of their protection of the a very important part of Melbourne culture, which is its live music economy. I'm going to assume that you've had some familiarity with Clause 5243, but can I just repeat for you the purposes of this clause? To recognise that live music is an important part of a state's culture and economy, to protect live music venues from encroachment of noise sensitive residential uses to ensure noise sensitive residential uses are satisfactorily protected from unreasonable levels of live music and entertainment noise, and to ensure that the primary responsibility for noise attenuation rests with the agent of change, which in this case is the proposal for residential apartments. Now, clause 5243 has been considered in recent times on a number of occasions by the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, and they have consistently and emphatically made it clear that it is not good enough to provide or to push to one side the steps you need to take to attenuate your residential apartments to conditions or future proposals. And that's what's being proposed here. In a decision that dealt with a proposal in the Darabin City Council and High Street to establish residential apartments near a live music venue, bar open, this VCAT said this, it was put to them that the details of the noise mitigation measures can be required by permit conditions and resolved through secondary consent. The tribunal said, we do not accept this approach. We agree with the other parties. The obligation is on the agent of change to identify as part of the proposal how the noise mitigation is to be implemented, not as an afterthought. The noise mitigation measures may require a substantial redesign of the north interface with consequential issues as to its fit in a sensitive streetscape and the amenity of the dwellings in respect of solar access, daylight and ventilation. What that's reflected in a number of other decisions, that principle is the consequences of what you need to do to attenuate the noise need to be considered as part of the proposal, not later on. Now, in this case, the developer has tried but hasn't done a good enough job. They've tried because they've put in an acoustic report that deals with airborne noise. But that's the easy part, because here we have a, effectively a communal wall. These two, the venue and the proposal, are going to share or at least have closely connected a common wall. And noise is not, or sound, is not just transmitted through air, it's transmitted through structures. And indeed, it's the structural transmission of noise, which you'll hear in a brief moment from an acoustician, which is the real trick. And the Renzo Tainan report doesn't address that. It doesn't deal with it in any way or propose any measures to deal with the transmission of sound through this effectively common wall. 
Now, you've been provided with a recommendation on behalf of your um, planning department. I'm not sure if you can get it up on the uh, screen, but in, they propose three conditions effectively to a deal with this um, conundrum. It's conditions 11, 12 and 13 on page 85. And these conditions will do nothing and will be wholly ineffective to address the issues which are facing the, the, of conflict between these two uses. You can see condition 11 proposes that the acoustic report of Renzo Tonin and Associates of April 2018 will form part of the permit and its recommendations have to be incorporated to building. Well, it has no recommendations about structural transmission of noise. It didn't consider it. Paragraph 12, it says you have to make sure that the recommendations in that report are incorporated into the development. There are no recommendations. Now, paragraph 13 has been referred to by Mr Camilleri in introduction. i just ask if you could wind yes, up, please. Yes, I'll be very quick. What it says is that after you've built the building, you have to put in an expert report to say that you comply with SEP N2 and you've attenuated noise. But if you haven't taken the necessary steps, there's nothing you can do about it if there's structural transmission of lawyers. What are you going to do? Knock down the building and start again? It doesn't work. The only way that you can ensure that there is no problem with structural transmission is to identify the problem and design it out. So we invite you, we ask you, to preserve the integrity of Clause 5243 and to follow what VCAT has directed in relation to this and reject this proposal on the basis that it has failed to demonstrate that it can protect itself from the noise from this very important venue. Now, uh, Mr. Thank you. We're going to ask Mr. Butera to come forward now. He's an acoustician and he's going to tell you about this issue of noise transmission. Yep. Please come forward. I'll yes. just ask as well, please, if, um, if you summarise your, your points so we're not touching <coughs> on what's previously been said. Evening, councillors. My name is uh, Frank Butera. I'm an associate with Arab, it's an international engineering firm. Um, located in Melbourne. Um, there's two significant issues um, with this application when it comes to um, noise and music noise. Uh, one is airborne noise, which travels freely through the air, and the other one, structure-borne noise. Um, and structure-borne noise um, is similar to knocking your fist or your knuckles on the table and listening to it travel throughout. Um, and the more stiff the product is, um, the more easier it'll travel through um, the material and be re-radiated. Uh, and we're suggesting that um, is that noise through concrete can be radiated um, six, seven, 12 storeys high, uh, depending on uh, the noise source um, and, the, um, uh, uh, and where the noise sensitive uses are. Um, I've been involved with um, Numerous, um, if, not, if dozens of scenarios, um, in particular with the city of Stonington and the city of Port Phillip, uh, where I've actually entered ve venues and um, dwellings where um, airborne noise and structure-borne noise has been a serious problem. And um, um, as previously detailed, there's very little that can be done about it after the fact, um, unless there was some sort of rebuild that was going on. The issue, the issue in particular with this development is, is that we can probably possibly control um, airborne noise, but we're going to have some serious difficulty trying to control structure-borne noise. If you envisage a train going past, um, you don't you feel the vibration coming through the ground, and you also hear the noise. So it's similar uh, to the music levels that are being produced within the howler development or the howler venue, is that the music gets caught up. Um, inside the structure. So it's in the floor, in the walls and in the roof and then becomes re-radiated um, out to the adjacent materials. If there's a material connecting to that wall, uh, then uh, noise will be transmitted through into that, uh, into that space. Um, and so the, the significant issue with the, uh, with the original plans is the, the wall is adjacent um, and we've got really close bed heads against band rooms um, and so on. So um, only now recently has um, the applicant's acoustic consultant completed ground-borne vibration measurements and we still don't know uh, what um, the correct solutions should be um, with this section, with these amended plans that have gone through. Um, I just reiterate that finally 
uh, that the conditions that are put forward by um, in the officer's report uh, won't assist the applicant, uh, sorry, won't assist the occupants of those dwellings in the future, um, and it's not going to assist Howler. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other objectors that wish to speak tonight? <coughs> Please come forward. Thank you. Uh, my first time doing this, so thank you for listening. Um, I'm here uh, in three capacities. Firstly, as, as a Moreland City uh, resident, I live in Pasco Vale. Uh, secondly, as a live music lover, uh, Howler is, is a world class venue, as, as Brendan said, as my letter friend uh, also sort of reiterated. And thirdly, as a, as a senior journalist at the Herald Sun. Um, Fantastic. Could you please just um, so, highlight your name? Yeah, that will help one. Um, my name is Mikey Carl, and I'm one of the 426 uh, objectors. Now, I think that that's quite significant. The 426 people are putting up their hands and saying this this will not fly. In the current uh, in the current plan by the developers, uh, <clears throat> I think they mean well, but I think we all know that once these apartments are up, it's just going to cause a massive, massive headache. And I guess I'm willing to fight tooth and nail in all three capacities to, to stop it, it, it happening, because otherwise it's going to cause a headache for, uh, for you know, for Brendan, the owner, and for sort of live music fans who will constantly be, you know, having this place shut down, which happened at the Tote in 2010, which is why we are here tonight, because the agent of change law has come in. So I guess, yeah, I'll be very, very brief, but we urge council to defer its decision in this application to review the process for which the application has been assessed to date. And that's also on behalf of Music Victoria as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other objectors here tonight that wish to say something? Okay, thank you very much. Um, is a representative of the applicant or the applicant here tonight that wishes to speak, please come forward. Uh, thank you, councillors. My name is Bo Ford from SJB Architects, representing um, the architects and the developer. Um, I'd just like to start by saying that um, we have over 40 years experience um, as a company um, building residential buildings and, uh, and are well aware of, of um, quality and design um, for, for residents and, and the agent of change principle is one that we were very aware of when we, um, when we started this process. Um, we always take a very contextual approach um, and therefore, as you've probably seen um, from the plans and the perspectives and the design, um, we've really interrogated the area. So our use of materiality, our activation of the laneways um, of Michael Street, um, balancing um, all of these things and, and trying to introduce really strong um, ESD principles. Uh, we were preceding the, the better apartment design standards, but we made an effort um, to resubmit the plan so that over 50% of the apartments became accessibly compliant. Um, so there's a real uh, commitment for this, uh, for this project to, um, to stand on its own as, as, a, as a really um, great example of, of residential living. Um, there are a number of items um, that did come up when we understood uh, Halla, uh, live music venue, which I've, I've been to a few times. Um, was next door. So we engaged experts, uh, not being fully conversed in all of the technicalities and scientific um, technicalities of um, the uh, acoustic issues. Um, so we undertook a, a number of design amendments, um, which saw uh, what is sort of understood by everyone, um, including um, the objectors, uh, acoustician, um, to be uh, compliant as far as acoustic um, uh, airborne noise. And they're things like uh, introducing winter gardens and uh, real realigning apartments, um, flipping the floor plan as you've seen in um, in some of the amendment amended plans. So that, uh, another thing is also redesigning all of the apartments that are near the uh, the Howler boundary, so that no uh, bedrooms um, are next to the uh, boundary. So there's effectively at least one room away. Um, the other thing is is as we become became more understanding of the uh, structural or the possibilities of the structural issues. Uh, we also uh, attempted to pull all of the structure off the boundary. Um, I won't go into any more acoustic details. I'll leave that up to our, our acoustic expert. Um, but that is pretty much all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. So, councillors, do you, uh, we have any questions yeah, for the question? applicant? Yes, yeah. Councillor Bolton. Yeah, I like to know why the acoustic report done for the for the applicant didn't deal with the question of structural noise especially as um, as you say you've been in the business for a very long time and are very aware of the agent of change principle and then secondly when this issue came up from the objectors why um, 
it took so long to get something done about structural noise and why the results weren't distributed to all parties um, much sooner than this so that I understand from the other acoustic person who spoke just before that they've only just seen them or maybe haven't seen them and wasn't quite sure. But yeah, what if you could answer those questions? Yep. Uh, Please uh, come up to the lectern. Uh, Nick from Renzo Permanent Acoustics. I've been helping out uh, SJV and uh, was involved in the initial assessment of the, um, of the uh, development. Um, yes, so when we initially uh, assessed, we measured what we measured what we saw on site uh, back in 2017, early 2017. Uh, it was um, was brought to our attention, I think, maybe nine months ago. Uh, the uh, objections and we've been, uh, I think, we've coordinated with them since, and uh, SJB and uh, myself have coordinated uh, design responses. Uh, I reckon six months ago or something like that, uh, which. Uh, can't comment on uh, how they were submitted and whatnot, but they're quite similar to as they are showing now. Uh, have I answered all of your points? Sorry. Have, have the results been handed to all of the other parties and how long ago? Have the results. Uh, the... I conducted the update. I've conducted the last bit of uh, testing uh, after we coordinated access to the site. Uh, to both sites, so we do simultaneous uh, measurements. Uh, let see, I put them out on Wednesday last week. I was out on site on Saturday night, on Tuesday <coughs> night, and I've been processing results <coughs> like hell ever since uh, to get the uh, respective noise levels so that they can be, uh, so that the final details can be incorporated into the plans. Okay. I think, does that... Guess what? Why wasn't the structural noise issue addressed in the original acoustic report? It wasn't report? initially observed, I'm afraid. That's that's the answer. Yep. Okay. It, um, it, could you please repeat that? Sorry. The, the question was why wasn't the structural noise yeah. originally it, included? It wasn't initially observed when uh, when we were there. There wasn't uh, when I was there, uh, 2017. There just there wasn't bass coming through that wall. Uh, okay. Uh, it may have been, if I suspect it lined up with uh, scheduling of uh, you know, less um, exuberant acts, um, which was unfortunate. But Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, councillors, are there any other questions? Do you have a question? No? Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I have one question um, just asking in regards to taking this to VCAT before it came before council for a decision. Is there any particular reason why you decided to take to VCAT before allowing council to make a decision? Um, yes, there was. So uh, in consultation with, um, with our acquisition and uh, engaging with some of the objectors concerns and how uh, legal representatives actually went through a number of, um, of modifications to the design, which saw um, the introductions of, of some of the, um, the acoustic recommendations that um, we were uh, processing from our acoustician. So there was a number of um, iterations of, of the design. Um, we didn't feel, well, our client didn't feel that we were going to get a satisfactory, we weren't going to get to a point with, um, with the objectors where they would be satisfied with what we did unless we completely changed the design um, and basically had no apartments at all on the site. Um, so that was why uh, the developer decided to proceed with um, with BCAT um, at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, there's no further questions. Um, I know that Councillor Tapanos is, is on his feet. Um, Councillor Tapanos, would you thank like you, to... Chair. Um, um, I'd like to uh, propose an alternative that Council's position at BCAT be one of refusal to grant the planning permit application. Um, and if I have a second, I'll, I'll second. further. Um, second. And if we can get the... Councillor Dorney? Yes, excellent. So that's seconded by Councillor Dorney. That's great. I think we can get that on the screen. Is it possible to just get it on the screen as well? Okay. Um, thank you, um, Chair and Councillors and members of the gallery. Uh, first, I'd like to comment a little bit about some of the good things in this application, and it is a good design uh, building. 
And uh, I understand and appreciate the attention that has gone into those features. Um, and in particular, I'd like to commend the environmental sustainable features um, of the application. However, from what I hear, there is more work that does need to be done in order to protect future residents from noise and vibrations. Um, we know that this is an activity centre. Uh, we know it's uh, within our Sydney Road kind of precinct, which not sh doesn't just have Howler, but also has a number of live music venues. Um, and therefore, I think that that work does need to be done. And the time to do that work is now. Um, you know, nothing annoys me more than having uh, apartments going up in our activity centres and then having new residents who actually then come and live next to a live music venue and then complain about noise coming from that venue. So that's not fair. It is time now in the initial stages, in the planning permit stages, to make sure that there isn't any negative impacts on those future residents. Um, and, and that is the job of, of, of the applicants. Uh, and that's what the agent of change rules and principles require that we take into consideration now, and it is the responsibility of the applicants considering how that is an existing venue. Uh, now, we've heard today how Howlow is one of the premier venues, and I believe that, not, not just for Brunswick, but also for Melbourne. Um, it contributes to the arts and the culture of our city, and it's one of the reasons why so many people want to come and live in Moreland, um, and that is something worth protecting contributes economically, of course, to our city um, and to the reputation of our city as a vibrant place to be and live. And most of you will also know that Brunswick in particular has the highest concentration of singer-songwriters, musicians and other artists. So it is our job and our community demands it that we do protect venues such as Howler. And we've already lost so many other venues from our suburb. So many live music venues have shut down because there's been a new owner, um, and, and they want to develop the site or, or they've shut down because of numerous complaints. So we need to say enough is enough and we need to protect the venues that we currently have that contribute so much to our city. Um, so I guess for me when I read the reports and particularly the acoustic reports, um, I'm not certain um, that it does offer that protection. Uh, I think the reports are insufficient and they're obviously disputed. So I'm not comfortable to be able to approve a permit today that would put power and potentially other venues at risk in the future. So I'm urging a refusal, um, and I would like to see more work from the applicants um, in regards to not just the acoustic reports, but the design of the building to make sure that there won't be any complaints around noise in the future, because um, we don't want to see that as a council. Your future residents deserve peace and quiet, and Howler, that's been there and operated, and many other venues deserve to be able to continue to do so into the future and continue to contribute to our city. So I'm urging the refusal on those grounds. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Dorning, would you like to speak? Uh, yes, I'd also like to um, commend the architects on um, some great integrity on ESD features of this um, development. Um, that, all, that considered, I, I don't feel satisfied um, that the agent of change has been addressed um, through noise and, and particularly considering the structural, what was it? Vibration. Structural borne vibrations, particularly moving through concrete, and how can that can move up levels as well? And, and looking at the, um, even looking at the without prejudice plans that we're not actually um, assessing tonight, I still am not convinced. I feel like there needs to be some work done. So that's why I'm supporting a refusal tonight. Thank you very much, Councillor Dorney. Um, at this point, I ask: Are there any councillors that wish to speak against I'm this against um, motion? Uh, Councillor Bolton, I know you wanted to second the item, but you can make a comment as well. I would like to make an, some extra points. Um, firstly, I think the whole notion of trying to fix a building once it's built is ridiculous. And in Moreland, um, we've got a policy of, um, of protecting industrial areas to um, try and provide blue-collar jobs and try and... Um, make sure there's some areas of our municipality where things can be manufactured or built or mechanics workshops, et cetera, without annoying nearby residents with noise, et cetera. And I think really the same sort of principle should apply to live music venues. Um, you know, because this, I mean, I come from a city where uh, originally where um, you didn't have all the little 
pubs with um, live music like Melbourne and Sydney had. And, um, you know, I think really people in Brisbane missed out a lot, even though there was a music scene up there. Um, people missed out on having um, as much of that live music as people in Melbourne and Sydney um, grew up to just take for granted. Um, you know, I, I think um, if this project went ahead, this development went ahead, it would be, as the um, one of the objectors pointed out, it would be a total headache for council. It would occupy a lot of council resources in dealing with complaints, as well as um, the owners and patrons of, of Howler as well. I um, I really am pretty shocked that you know I can I can, I can understand um, the acoustician from for the uh, developer was there when there was a quieter act on, but really. Um, you know, I guess any knowledge of Howler would have to assume there'd be a lot, a lot of acts, a lot of performances where there would be structure-borne noise. So I'm really pretty shocked that that was not included. Um, you know, going back on at a different time to um, when other acts were performing to check out the structure-borne noise. Um, and, you know, probably if Howler was planning to set up beside residents that had been there for a long time, I probably would have opposed power setting up in that particular spot, like I did with um, a proposal for basically a beer barn in the middle of residences at Pentridge. But this is different. Howler was there first. Um, it's a very successful um, centre of culture for people in Melbourne. And I think we've got to project, protect that. I just don't think it is right to have a huge number of residences right beside a butting um, a venue like Howler, and I, you know, <laughs> I I would appeal to the applicant to withdraw the case from VCAT and um, come up with some other mm. proposal for something else, some other <coughs> purpose other than um, residences right beside um, Howler. I don't even know that putting bedrooms on the opposite side of the building will necessarily deal with the case. I'm not an expert in these sort of matters, but I'm not sure that that will necessarily deal with the case. Um, but I don't feel assured at all. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Um, Councillor Abu. Thank you. Um, I just want to read something uh, very quickly. So. Looking, I spent about an hour reading this application the first time round. Um, I literally sat down and just kept reading for an hour, and it's a really impressive application. Provision of a large communal first floor courtyard and roof deck, no reliance on borrowed light for any of the bedrooms. You know, it goes on and on. Exceed the minimum 4.5 metre setback. Um, apartment depths do not exceed 8 metres, ensuring light will penetrate into the apartments. Cross ventilation to 50%, accessibility to 50%, good punch, uh, apartment sizes with functional layouts, balcony si sizes that generally exceed, blah, blah, it goes on and on. And I stalked um, on the internet, as we all do probably on a daily basis, the um, architects and was su super impressed with the calibre of the work. So I've got that in my left hand and then I've got this in my right hand. Every time Nick Cave comes to Australia, I might choke, and sings, I believe in the rapture for I've seen your face on the floor of the ocean at the bottom of the rain, I truly believe that he's singing to me. Mm -hmm. Now, that's my temple, that's my church. I grew up in Fitzroy, which I've mentioned many times, but I'm 46. That means I was at the punters when you were still stuck to the floor of that place. And I've been dancing upstairs at Bar Open when I thought I was going to crash through to the bottom floor with everyone else and die, and it didn't matter at the time. But the thing about Nick Cave is that Nick Cave didn't always live on an island in the Thames. He started off in dingy little clubs and pubs like the Tote and like what has become Howler now. Um, and it's really important that if we have such a good quality development here and we have such an important part of the community, this is where people... Performing arts and music is where people express themselves. It's about social commentary without Van Batam and all those other nutters. It's just people singing a song. It's about people supporting each other and reaching out to each other and people grab onto that stuff. It's a really important part of the fabric of the community that we're standing here to represent. So I think that considering the nature of this development and the nature of what we need to protect in the city, this is the ultimate sensitive interface. What we come up with all the time is sensitive interfaces. We're protecting residents in double storey houses from six storey developments. We have to find that conversation and I just feel like the situation that we're trying to address with this application 
is one of the most sensitive interfa interfaces that we've seen and it needs more work. It needs much more work because there will be vibrations, there's going to be bands bumping out at two in the morning and that's noisy. It's exciting when you finish a gig, all the, all the roadies are half deaf anyway so they yell. Mm. Like all of this stuff is just bottom line, it needs to be dealt with. And so even though I love this application and I love Howler, I, I can't let this go through the way it is and I agree and I commend the South Ward councillors for taking responsibility for this and I'm happy to support the refusal on this application. Thank you, Councillor Abood. Um, given I've allowed most councillors to speak in this item, are there any other councillors that wish to speak? No? Okay. Uh, in that case, I'd like to... Sorry. No, in that case, um, I'd like to put this uh, alternative motion to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried unanimously. I'll now pass back to officers for next steps. Thank you. So the Urban Planning Committee has resolved that its position at uh, VCAT will be one of refusal for the grounds placed on the screen above. That matter is uh, scheduled to take place uh, in a merits hearing for four days in June. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now give the gallery a moment if they wish to um, step out. Thank you. So now moving on to the next item on the agenda, and that is uh, 151 Melbourne Avenue, Glenroy, Planning Permit MPS 2017-589. Sorry, Sarah. Sorry. Just, sorry, Sarah. I just ask that you hand that out. Um, uh, can, you just, can you just hold a moment and let the officer speak, and then I can ask you to come forward and, and talk to that, if that's okay. Thank you. Please. Thank you, thank you, councillors, and again, members, members of the gallery. The uh, final item for this evening is an application of 151 Melbourne Avenue in Glenroy. It involves the demolition of an existing dwelling, uh, which is uh, covered by heritage overlay and fence, and the construction of eight new dwellings on the site. I think uh, the, uh, the slide that's on the screen probably is the best indication of, uh, I guess, what, what is before us tonight. What we have is an image uh, in the top left-hand corner from 2010, state of the existing dwelling, as it was uh, eight years ago in 2014, uh, in the bottom corner, and then you'll see uh, the condition of the house in 2017. Um, the, the subject site has been the subject of a number of applications in the past. There was an application back in 2011 uh, which allowed demolition of outbuildings and involved the construction of um, uh, six dwellings on the site and converting that existing dwelling, as you see on the screen, into two dwellings. In 2015, um, the owner of the land, um, and I believe it was a different owner, 2015 sought the demolition of the existing dwelling and outbuilding, um, and that application was refused by council. That application was, that determination was not appealed at VCAT. Um, and we're now here in 2018 uh, with the application again to demolish it. As you can see, there has been some, um, some further deterioration of, of the dwelling. So that's uh, the layout of the, the site. Uh, and what we have, councillors, is a proposal for eight new two-storey dwellings down the site. The driveway at the front of the site curves uh, to avoid uh, some infrastructure in the nature strip. Two dwellings and three bedrooms. There was a structural report uh, submitted with uh, the application as well. Council's here advisor reviewed it. She wasn't satisfied that the uh, development of the existing dwelling was of a state that had uh, supported demolition. There were six objections to the application. Uh, those uh, objections uh, included obviously the concerns with the, the demolition. Um, and the, that it was inconsistent with the individual heritage overlay over the site. Uh, and some concerns, obviously, about the dwelling being neglected. As you saw in the photos before, the amenity impacts of possible future development on the site and the usual issues about traffic and car parking. The officer's recommendation to the councillors uh, this evening with this application is that no planning permit should issue, similar to the 2015 application. Um, obviously, the concerns being demolition from a heritage perspective. Um, and there are also some concerns with uh, the construction 
of the, the usual and stuff from part of the planning scheme. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. So can I ask if there are any objectors that we should speak tonight? Um, so I could ask that uh, you please come forward as first up, if you'd like. Me? Yep, please. My name is Celia Barbosa. Um, I'm on Bramble Street, which you sort of saw one of the photos there, the street view. It's um, the street directly opposite this house. I'm at number one near the corner there, uh, Bramble Street above the top corner there. Um, I don't know if councillors you're aware of the history of the area. Um, you know, this little pocket of Glenroy was known as Glenroy Farm. It was owned by Kennedy Brothers, um, Duncan and Donald, um, <coughs> until they, the last of them died in 1964. Um, it was then owned by several people, uh, they had several owners until eventually it was owned, uh, bought up by a syndicate called the Glenroy Land Company um, in 1886. Um, so they, the Glenroy Land Company planned to build uh, a whole lot of mansions in the area. They promoted it as Turek of the North. Um, and so many uh, Victorian houses, substantial houses were built during that time. Um, after the 1890s recession hit, and so they, uh, the housing, uh, new mansions weren't built anymore after that point. And then, um, uh, so things came to a halt. In the early 1900s, um, well, uh, the Glenroy Land Company went into receivership and it was sold off again. I'm not sure who owned it after that. But once again, they tried to revive this Turek of the North, um, one of the about 20 or so Houses were built in the early 1900s, which I believe this was one of them. Once again, they were trying to promote the mansions in Turek of the North. So that's one of the reasons why the Northern Golf Club was built, to try and attract affluent buyers. You know, Glenroy State School was built. Do you, uh, we have any? So my concern is if we allow this property, this building to be demolished, because someone has allowed it to get into such a state of disrepair in such a small window, how can we allow this with all these other mansions around the place? You know, we set a really bad precedent if we allow this to happen. It's very concerning. Um, house directly behind me, which is just off the top there, you can't see it on the map there, is one of these grade B listed buildings. Just to the right, 50 metres of that, is a grade A building owned by the Anglican Church. Beautiful, big Victorian mansion. They're scattered all around the place. If we allow all these buildings to be demolished, we lose the story of Glenroy. So I just ask you to please consider opposing this, because it's just really sad. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. Sue, so, would you like to come up? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Leo Maguire is my name and I live directly over the road from this property. So when I open the blinds in the morning, I see the subject property. A lot has occurred over a period of time in three years. Some of the photographs submitted with my application, um, there was a few in number, but some of the photographs submitted with the, uh, the, with the applicant don't really tell the full story of what's happened. And I've got a selection of photographs here, just seven if I may distribute these to yeah, the Yeah, please council. just pass them to, to the end there. I can send them around for you if you like. Please continue talking. This is the history of um, what has happened to the building in just three years. In When the settlement took place, uh, the possession of the property took place in January 2015, it's just over three years ago now. This was a, a property resided in by the Wordsworth family, as they had over the last 60 years. I've been in my property now for over 50 years. 
and that property has always been in good nick. We can see that in two years later on page one of my photographs there, how the front of the property has been blown out when the high winds are on. But if we flip over to the page three of my photographs there, page three, we can see how the history of this destruction got underway. Uh, in my opinion, somebody has climbed on the roof, taken off that point right up the very top and has allowed the sheeting to come undone and the wind has done the rest. That was taken on um, March 2015, just two months after possession. I think the plan to destroy the building was underway at that point of time. I don't know who did it, but that uh, point is five to six metres above ground level. You can't just go out there with a hammer. You've got to use a long extension ladder, probably one and a half times the height of this ceiling. Comments in the neighbourhood have, uh, have been reported along the lines, if I could just get rid of this residence, I could build a lot more units. And that was the owner talking to one of the neighbours over the fence on a chat. If you sign my petition to demolish this residence at 151 Melbourne Avenue, and when I win, you two can knock down your place. That was the owner of the residence we're talking about now talking to the owner of another heritage overlay in the immediate neighbourhood. When I win this, you can knock down yours too. They were horrified. That was in November 2016. At one stage uh, in October 2016, there was 27 sheets of iron missing off the roof of the premises. 27 sheets of iron missing off the roots of the roof of the, of the residence. They had blown off in high winds. They gathered on the floor. I saw the owner picking them up and taking them around to the back instead of putting them back on the roof. No other residents in the area, buildings in the area, have suffered the damage during those high winds, the high rains that we've had. We've had, uh, we've had 1,600 millimetres of rain during the period of ownership. 1,600 millimetres of rain, 63 inches. And that's come from the Weather Bureau at uh, the Essendon Airport. Just ask if you could please summarise, sir. My, my request is that it's been already uh, considered by council and the VCAT and that be maintained. I think uh, the owners have a responsibility to the community to maintain the building and that's been let down badly. Um, this uh, building is for the benefit of the community, not only for today but into the future. And I think the owners were aware of that. They bought the building with plans approved by Moreland Council and Heritage Victoria. They bought plans which included the construction of eight units, the same number of units that we're having at the moment, and that had space for 17 park off-street parking. I believe uh, my recommendation is that the application be dismissed and a recommendation could be to that the owner goes back, uh, that the owner be requested to revert back to the plans um, that were approved already and demolition as we see demolition of a heritage building is not an excuse for demolition thank you thank you very much are there any other objectors that wish to speak please come forward hello my name is maria and i also um uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from quite well, quite a passionate sort of Side as well. I also have some images that I'd like to hand out. I think this is the plan that you were originally um, approved. It was a little bit more considerable because you included in the, the actual uh, bathroom of it. And these are images of the house, the interior of the house. And I cry when I look at the engineer's reports compared to, and it was in 2014, I think it was one of the um, real estate um, uh, images that was available. I, also implore uh, the council to reject the application to approve the demolition of the existing dwelling and fence of 151 Melbourne Avenue um, on the grounds that it doesn't um, even consider the heritage overlay. Um, the house was um, assessed to be of significant um, local, of local significance and historical value and should uh, continue to be con protected by council. I have lived in Glenroy for over 50 years and um, in that time the building has always and the garden has always been maintained. As a young woman, I would frequently walk past uh, the house and when the gardens were in full bloom, it would lift my spirits. Um, 
Now I walk past uh, the home and I'm horrified. Um, it has stood majestically for over 100 years and only in the, the last four years has it been neglected and allowed to deteriorate. Um, now I don't want to repeat a lot of the points that everyone else has discussed. Uh, um, I, where are we? Uh, again, in light of the current Andrews uh, Labor government's tough stance on uh, to protect state listed assets with harsher penalties and giving local government a stronger voice, why isn't um, council enforcing penalties to provide a disincentive and reach a resolution? This has been going on for such a long time. It's actually quite frightening. Um, yeah, I just hope that uh, you listen to the residents and do the right thing by our suburb. I have, uh, and, I th and I think you've heard this before, we have been, for the most part, unheard and forgotten, and I hope that you, this time, listen to the residents. I don't live near the actual um, the home. I live many streets further away, and like I said, I used to walk to college, to school, to shopping, and it used to give me joy just walking past and seeing the garden and the house. And I used to always think, one day I'm going to own that. And unfortunately, because of the price, I was never able to own it myself. And I would have restored it, not developed it. And I also, um, uh, with regards to the initial developments, was outraged when they, it was first proposed. But I can also concede that a, including the building as opposed to not including the building in a thought out and considered um, development is better than no building at all. So I do ask you to um, consider that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, are there any other objectors that wish to speak? to this item. No? Okay. Um, thank you. In that case, I ask if the applicant or a representative of the applicant is here that would wish to speak. Um, and so I believe you were handing out those. If you pass them just to the end here. Thank you. Thank you. There's two sets of documents there, um, photos and a report. Thank you, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, my name is Pauline Maltus. I'm of Keystone Alliance Town Planners. And in my 25 years of experience, I have had extensive involvement um, in the assessment of heritage applications and including demolitions, um, just to demonstrate that I have experience in matters like this. Um, my submission will focus on facts, not assumptions of how damage occurred to the building. Um, and I will just note that the applicant, not the applicant, the owner has complied with all council orders relating to um, the safety of the building. And that would be on council's records um, in relation to the building itself and maintaining the grass, etc. Unfortunately, vandals, um, squatters, etc., have um, also terrorised the building. Uh, because that's the state it's in today. Um, the key considerations in this case are firstly to determine whether the demolition is justified and if so, whether the replacement buildings can be supported under Clause 55 of the planning scheme. Having inspected the site um, just yesterday, and as you'll see in all the photographs that attached there, and there are many, um, the state of the property is... Um, something you might find in a horror movie, um, unfortunate, but that's the case. Having inspected and reviewed all the material and reports in my assessment, the demolition of this dwelling does satisfy the planning scheme tests um, for council to make a decision to allow its removal, and I'll embellish on that a little bit later on. The statement of significance notes that the site is significant for its aesthetics rather than a broader historical significance. Its significance in its form and original state is not disputed. What needs to be determined here tonight is whether its current structural state in fact meets the relevant test under Clause 22.8, which is the heritage policy, which I'm sure you're familiar with uh, as outlined in the report. If its demolition is accepted, then we are confident that the remaining issues and grounds of refusal um, outlined in the recommendation can be addressed. However, I think the key consideration here tonight um, does rest on the demolition. Without demolition, obviously, development can't occur. But demolition and the determination on that 
um, from my assessment does stand in its own right and is justified, unfortunately, in this case. Essentially, the requirement is to demonstrate that the building is, and this is out of the planning scheme, structurally unsound, which it is, and that the contributory or significant heritage fabric has deteriorated beyond reasonable repair and would require reconstruction of the whole. This test is clearly met. The expert engineer's report, and that is a document that's been circulated, as I wasn't certain whether all councillors had received a full copy of that, and to make it quick and easy, I've highlighted the relevant conclusions within, those, within that report. And it includes a, a most recent um, assessment as well. The expert engineer's report uh, provides a conclusion that the level of disrepair of the existing dwelling would result in a reconstruction. Their advice is that to remediate the building effectively requires full reconstruction and that it is not economically or physically practical to remediate the existing building and therefore they do recommend demolishing the existing deteriorated building. A costing has also been obtained including that to rebuild and what it would cost to build a new home. And the um, difference is significant. The cost of rebuilding is far higher than that to rebuild a home of the same size. And I have information regarding that, if you would like to have more information there. So this um, cost matter just goes to the issue and the argument of demonstrating that it really is a reconstruction. It isn't a restoration. Council's assessment at page 67. I'll just ask you to yes. um, summarise, please, if you can. Oh, oh gosh. I did this before, it took me three minutes. <laughs> um, so Council's assessment at page 67 in indicates a proposal does not meet these tests. Um, but I think it, it, it's as clear as day in the report and the wording is very conclusive um, that it does meet the tests. And what in fact is the decision that needs to be made tonight is whether that test is met. Um, we're not here to um, have opinions about um, the state of the building, the fact is, the state of the building it is in as per the photos and although unfortunate, if it is allowed to be demolished, a, a record would need to be retained and that's what normally occurs with demolished heritage properties. Um, just a comment on um, the heritage advisors' um, comments in the report that they weren't satisfied with the structural engineer. I would just say that they're not qualified, neither are we to... Um, make that comment. Um, it is a structural engineer who I'll is the expert. Just ask you to summarise, please. Yes. Uh, and the client has owned the property for the last four years and it has remained un unoccupied. It has been vandalised. There have been trespasses, persons squatting, weather elements, and it is the state it is in today. I realise this is a difficult decision for council to make and it is unfortunate. However, if we strictly base a decision on the evidence, the expert reports and the current physical state, there seems to be no question that the test is met for demolition in this case. And should that be accepted, then we consider that design matters for the proposed development can be addressed um, with the changes through conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, councillors, do we have any questions for the uh, applicant? Councillor um, Blue? Yeah, I do have a question. I'm just wondering why the build didn't happen when the permit was issued initially. Like, what? why the four years down the track, why the permit that was approved wasn't... This is so the, prior to the four years? So the dwelling was purchased with the permit in place? The reason it hasn't been rented... The well, it is the reason it hasn't been rented, but also why was the build why was the build not um, engage, engaged? Like, why was the work not started? Like, why the four year waiting period? What was? I understand that was th this is the current owner for this proposal that was under a previous owner that previous application, and I think that was for six dwellings. Yep. The re yes. Yep. Um, that is that was not their intention for, for this property owner. They purchased it. Um, what was their intention? Uh, sorry, oh, maybe I'll probably, uh, no I'll, embroider, debate, I'll, probably should, I'll retract that. I can't speak for the intention. The facts are they purchased it four years ago. Um, it was, yes, it was purchased uh, and with the uh, town planning for a, uh, to the uh, six, seven house at the mm -hmm. back with the car park underneath. Mm -hmm. And 
putting the two uh, the buy to this house into uh, to apartment. That was the town planning which I was purchased on this condition. Mm -hmm. I'm asking why you didn't go ahead with the build. Why I didn't build? Yes. It was not practical to uh, dig under car, under, underneath car park. And is there a reason why you didn't um, get a new application for this particular property that you had bought? Like, did you feel like the property was you were holding as an in investment, or uh, was there a reason was, why it you? Was, of course, it was for investment property. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So investment. then, my next question is: I'm wondering why the property wasn't rented out. Like, I'm wondering why you didn't endeavour to protect your investment. When I took a possession, possession, I tr clean up the block land, yeah. and, and and the more I discover, I've done my homework. And while I was doing my own work, I'm a builder by trade. I've been a builder all my life. Mm -hmm. And I've done all extension and renovation. Mm -hmm. And I know what takes this, this house here, it is unrepairable. And that's, um, that's why I let the application overlap. I see that the, the state of the property now m would definitely suggest that it's unrepairable. My question is to do with when you purchased the property four years ago. I'm just interested to know why you didn't protect your investment by leasing it out or by putting in some kind of... Um, so I was looking for one of those copies of the yeah, engineer's sure. report. Yep, yep, yep. The engineer's report? Yeah, I'll just leave Look, I think on the basis of what the owner is saying and his experience as a builder looking at the house, um, obviously, even at that time, regardless of what something looks like cosmetically, structurally and all the rest of it, then it, it possibly wasn't the case um, underneath the exterior. So he would have done an assessment. There's been a lot of um, <coughs> orders issued by council, local laws, which have all been complied with to keep the property... Uh, in a safe state. Unfortunately, since when you purchased it, and look, I went in there yesterday, there's clearly trespassers, there's people squatting in there. I didn't yeah. see them, but I don't have any questions about the current state of the building. My, my questions are to do with the state of the building in 2014 when it was purchased. Yeah, um, and I, I can see from the outside, but my question is to do with protecting the investment. Um, I, I suggest, Councillor Abu, that we might not be getting a response to this sure. question yeah. um, and we might just it's uh, move on. It's kind of an on. emotional question, it's not a, a factual as to what the intent uh, is. But uh, I'll yeah. be the judge of that, Apologies. thank you. Um, Councillors, are there any other questions you would like to ask of the applicant? Um, I, I'd just like to ask one question from the Chair and that is, uh, you got the, uh, the construction uh, reports done uh, at the start when you moved into the, when you first purchased the property, is that correct? These ones here that we're, you've been given. So, yeah, that's, that's awesome. did, did you um, did you seek heritage advice um, yes. at that time? Well, I knew there was uh, um, I had a heritage uh, on this property, but I I took it as a, an investment mm. uh, to develop as it was a town planning. But as I discovered that it was not economical to develop for this site. It, it was just the house, the new house at the back and the old rotten house at the front. It, it didn't make sense to me. All of the burying, uh, stunters, joyous, underneath the old rotten up to the roof. The winter last month, the last winter came and they blew the roof off. Okay, no, thank, thank you. Thank you. That, that answers my question. Uh, Council, you yours. Speranza, if you don't mind me asking, you don't have to answer this. Um, you bought the property four years ago. Do you mind me asking how much you paid for the property? $800,000. Okay, so when you bought it, did you know that it was definitely a heritage listed? Yes, property? yes, yes. You definitely knew that. Definitely knew, yes. So if it was heritage listed, then it's very unlikely, from my experience, I've been on the urban planning committee for the block, but I had a friend of mine call me last week and I said, Probably unlikely that you'll be able to develop a heritage listed property. It's very rare that council, it might go to BCAT, even BCAT doesn't, they might be included. So what I'm saying is if you were quite clear that when you bought this four years ago, definitely heritage listed, um, the only thing you can really do with that is to, you've got to keep the front facade and the planners will elaborate on that. It, it surprises me a little bit that, that owners be aware. You knew you bought that, you knew it was heritage listed. 
you need that if you're going to do anything, you're going to do anything around it, not on it. I, I initially thought, well, maybe, I mean, I don't, I'm not a massive supporter of heritage, I've got to be honest with you. But in saying that, I've, I've heard the residents, and must I just say, one resident in particular who I had met last year. Just ask you to get to the question, please, Councillor. Just before the council elections. And he went through with me in very, very de detailed form as to what the process has been and the number of the neighbours who have complained. I'm just a bit surprised, as Councillor Booties, that in four years you've done nothing to it. I mean, $800,000 is a lot of money to invest. So my question is, sorry, Mr Chair, is why did you seriously wait that long? Like, it just doesn't make sense. As I, as I said before, when I purchased, I was my intention to develop and, uh, and move on. But then I discovered that the house was not uh, fit to be fixed. It was not, uh, was not uh, uh, good enough to be repaired. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, sir. I think, um, I think you've answered the question previously as well, so that, that's, that's okay. Um, do we have any other questions from councillors? Yeah, I got one for the officer. Um, okay, uh, well, might just see if there's any other questions for the applicant. No? Um, okay, um, Councillor Farnley. Uh, it'd be just good to create some clarity for the residents, but also for me. Uh, I note in your officer recommendation there isn't anything in regards to um, restoration. Is that because that's a separate process, uh, or is there a possibility of including incorporating that into this? Through the chair, um, I understand the recommendation is for refusal of the application. Um, so the um, the demolition of the dwelling is not being supported through that recommendation. Right. So there's nothing that we can incorporate to ask the developer to restore the building or rebuild. That no, is, that's that's, that's a separate, separate process. process. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for answering that, and um, and thank you to the applicant um, for coming and answering our many questions tonight. Uh, councillors, if we have no other uh, questions, um, I ask that uh, Councillor Davidson is on her feet. Uh, Councillor Davidson, uh, you have a motion? Yes, I do. I would like to move the officer's recommendation uh, as read in the officer report. Okay, now I'll ask for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Farnley. Thank you. Okay, so here we have a parcel of land. Um, and it's approximately 1,807 1, square metres. It's huge. It's a lot of land and there's a lot of profit to be made on it, as you've said, the astute investor. That's, one That's right, no comments, thanks. And it looks like a good investment, except for one problem. It is heritage listed. And that must be the bane of any applicant's existence, to find a property that is heritage listed, but on such a large piece pa parcel of land and in such a developable area. And we're back again. We were back here in 2015 where this exact piece of land was refused. It was refused, council said no. And just to turn to the statement of significance, um, and I'll just read a short little snippet from that. This, this house that is on this huge piece of land is of note because it's unusual and it's an early surviving example of a pre-World War I bungalow uh, outlaying an area in Melbourne. Uh, I'm at a loss as to where to begin with this and I echo the resident sentiments that have come here today and the emotion that you've expressed and the pure outrage as to what's made you come here today, the fact that this property that had its former glory where you said you used to walk past every day as a child and admire, has fallen into such a state of disrepair. It is appalling and it makes my blood boil. And it's almost ironical that we're here today for a heritage building that is pre-World War I. And yesterday, what was yesterday? Yesterday was Anzac Day, a day where we honour our past and all that comes with Anzac Day. And for me, that has a sad tinge of irony to it. 
And we have a heritage overlay on this building and it's something that needs to be protected. And since then, the home hasn't just fallen into disrepair. Intentionally or unintentionally, it is totally almost unrecognisable. But the question becomes, is it so far from repairing? Yes, there will be a lot of cost involved, definitely. But as previously said in 2015, not that long ago, for a home that has stood there for over a hundred years, a hundred years it stood there. It's weathered storms, it's weathered every kind of environmental thing that came past Glenroy and it stood there in its strength and its glory. But in three years, it looks like that? What? This is what part of um, the officer report says from back in 2015. Just ask you to uh, sure. Some Nevertheless, it was not considered that the dwelling is beyond reasonable repair. Rather, that the that repair is uh, not the most economically viable option for the site. and to reach out its arms and use the enforcement of both our building law and our local law to protect this home. And as my friend over here said, to restore it, because that would be the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We're not gonna be engaging in debate, sorry, sir, at this time. Uh, and I, I'll also remind councillors that um, not to be describing uh, the intent of the owner throughout uh, any speeches. We are not aware of that information. Uh, Councillor Afani. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you to all the objectors for, for I guess, uh, taking time out of your day to, um, to come here and, and uh, inform, especially the new councillors that don't know the history of this site, as to uh, some of the past uh, in regards to it. Look, I'm supporting the council officer's refusal to allow a permit uh, for the eight uh, units and the demolition of the property, uh, the heritage listed property, uh, on the grounds that uh, I do believe that this building, whether it needs to be rebuilt or repaired, uh, should be restored to its former glory uh, and maintained. Uh, on that grounds, I don't think the, uh, the, the right thing to do for the urban planning committee is to provide the development opportunity to, to destroy it and put uh, a bunch of units in its place. Uh, I do thank the uh, resident who provided the pictures um, from the last few years, especially the ones with the, the, um, the, the roofing, the colour bomb roofing on top that just come off. I, I think that's, that demonstrates to me um, that, uh, you know, after 100 years for, you know, those front uh, Caliban tin just to sort of flap off from uh, weather uh, is, is pretty interesting. Uh, so you, you are right, you would need a ladder to get up there and to, to do something, but I don't know who intended what, so I won't mention anything about intention. Um, so on those grounds, I am uh, refusing the uh, developer's application for the demolition job uh, and... Uh, I hope that uh, we have some sort of um, grounds uh, at a later process to look at how we can make sure that uh, this building is rebuilt slash restored. Thank you, Councillor Rafanli. Um, are there any councillors that wish to speak against this motion? No? In, in that case, um, I will put this... Sorry, we're not taking any more from the gallery. Uh, at, the, at this point, I will put the, uh, the motion the alternative motion to, to the vote, uh, sorry, the, the motion to the vote. Uh, all those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried unanimously. Uh, I will now pass back to the officers. Sorry, for... Could it be recorded as such that it was unanimous on council? Thank you. Uh, I now pass back to officers for next steps. Thank you, councillors. The Urban Planning Committee have the, has this evening uh, resolved to support the officer's recommendation to refuse to grant a planning permit for the demolition of the dwelling at 151 Melbourne Avenue in Glenroy. The applicant will have 60 days in which to lodge an appeal with VECA. The residents will have an opportunity to become a party should an appeal be lodged. Thank you, councillors. Thank you very much. 
Um, now, noting that um, we don't have any urgent business for tonight, um, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's watching at home. I'd like to thank those that came in the gallery. Um, and I'd like to now declare the Urban Planning Meeting uh, committee, committee meeting closed. Thank you very much.